So, hello everyone. Hello neighbors. So, my name is Juni, your host for today. So, as we continue to welcome like everyone who will be tuning in today, I want to like kick this off like this event by saying, "Welcome. Good day, mate. Mabuhay. Bonjour. Ano nga sa iyo? Sawari ka." So, why are we actually like, you know, gathering like today? So, we are here because we are celebrating like Book Week. So, for those who don't know, This is to recognize not only the like, importance of reading, but also to highlight amazing book authors, illustrators, publishers, and their works. So we are actually very lucky to have two esteemed Australian authors today who will share their creative processes, inspiration, favorite books, and who will also do a live reading of their books. So yeah, before I introduce like these amazing like you know women, This event is actually presented by Nextdoor. So for those who are not on Nextdoor yet, Nextdoor is the network where you can connect to your neighborhoods that matter to you so you can belong. So and to carry like that promise, so we are holding like this event because not only because not only like want we are, we want to connect like neighbors like online but we also want them like to connect in real life so if you don't want to miss any like events such as this go to your apple and google like play stores to download the app so next door will also help you to connect with neighbors who share like the same interest so we are here today because of that same interest our love for reading so as mentioned We have here with us today two amazing local authors who are both successful in their own fields. Our first guest for today is a mother of sons, a boy and a dog, and children's author and a radio presenter for community radio and who is from Northern Beaches in Sydney. So her weekly program by the book is a magazine show with music, news, reviews and interviews for the world of kids book creators. She is like the author of Daddy and the World's Longest Who. Please welcome Bridey Wright. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Happy Book Week, everyone. Happy Book Week, Juni. Happy Book Week, Bridey. Um, <laughs> and our <laughs> second, <Catherine, laughs> my fellow author. <laughs> yeah, our second guest um, for today is a writer of fiction for children and young adults who lives in Melbourne and enjoys visiting schools and appearing. At live and online author events such as these. So before writing her debut novel *Mind Call*, she worked as a cognitive scientist and a university lecturer in developmental like, psychology. Let's give a warm up applause to Catherine Cage Kanobi. Hi, Catherine. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks for coming. A good question. A writing journey. I think everyone's writing journeys are so different and can be quite long. <laughs> Mine is certainly about a uh, 40 something years in the making, I think. Uh, but yeah, so about um, eight, nine years ago, I started to sort of, I was really burning out from my corporate career. I had a young son, you know, I had a baby and, and it was just, wow. what am I doing? I just, all my energy goes into my corporate career. I want to do something at some point in my life to acknowledge my creativity. I'd always loved writing, Juni. So um, what I did when I took a break from that corporate uh, corporate career slog, had a bit of time off, you know, a few few months in between jobs, and suddenly I was spending all this time with my young son and my husband around the house. You know, a lot more time at home, and I started to become really creative. All these ideas were bubbling, but it was about my life. Things from my life and my son and my husband were giving me so much creative spark. And one day I just thought, "Daddy and the world's longest poo." Wow, that is a really funny concept. And it related to probably don't have to tell you all the gory details, but you know, my husband was spending heaps and heaps of time in the toilet. Maybe because I was home more, we were home together. But the point of this is, when I got that idea, I thought I've got to put this down. It just was bursting out of me. That's where my sort of adult uh, writing journey started. You know, apart from all the stuff I'd done as a kid and at high school in book competitions and that, that's when my adult writing journey started. The creativity. Uh, 
Um, well, when I was a kid, I, well, I guess all writers just love to read and I used to just get taken away into other worlds by reading and um, I was one of those kids that get lost in their imagination and I thought that the magic from the books was just waiting around the corner and I just needed to rub the right lamp or walk into the right wardrobe and I'd find it. Like I remember thinking the pine trees just past the park at the end of my street were the start of an enchanted wood. Um, so I've always loved story and I have just wonderful memories of being lost in stories when I was young in particular. Um, and then sort of like variety life circumstances meant that um, I just got a bit burnt out with um, my work as a um, cognitive developmental psychologist working in academia. And um, I said, I really want to write a book. I've always wanted to write a book. And so I wrote Mon Cull, which was the first novel that I'd written. And I was really committed to it. I really wanted to share the story with readers. So I started pitching it to agents and publishers. And when I got knockbacks, I just took on the feedback and I kept revising it and kept changing it and fixing it up. And um, that cycle went on for a while until I got offered a book deal by Ford Street Publishing in 2018 and it was published 2019. Yes, I have, always. Look, I think part of me has, yes. When I was at school from a young age, I was actually a really good writer. I, I think I can say that objectively. <laughs> I won some short story competitions and I used to go like I remember this writing in high school writing this you know diary from the perspective of Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights and oh getting God. 19 out of 20 for it thinking why didn't I get 20 but you know like I just I loved it and then you know what it was thick I was thinking about this yesterday when I was at a high school I wanted to be a Hollywood historian meaning someone who wrote books about Hollywood legends from the 50s right. and 60s. Oh my God. I have no idea where that dream went. I think it was sucked up by life and having to get a real job and stuff. But yeah. yes, I think I did always want to be a writer. But again, the need to earn money, the need to live, the need to have experiences, getting married, having a child. It, these things do get in the way. It's life, yeah. Well, I think when I, sometimes you have to fake it till you make it, they say. I mean, who, who deems you a writer? Who deems you a book writer? I guess if you write, you're a writer. And they do say, you know, when you start writing and pitching yourself as an author, you know, do, do own that. Because no one's going to come and give you a crown saying, you are now a writer, you are now an author. But I guess for me, what I did um, when I wrote uh, Daddy in the World's Longest Poo, I self-published this. So I wrote it, I, um, I had it published through a US company. I worked on the storyboarding, the illustrations. I thought, well, I have written this, I have published it, so I am an author. But yeah. in, in, in tandem with that, I was writing a lot of blogs. I was blogging and doing lifestyle and arts reviews, parents reviews for a Sydney Mums Group. And I guess professionally, when I might have been justified in being able to say someone else has deemed me a writer, was when I was actually given a, a, you know, a paid job um, part-time writing blogs for Sydney Mums Group. And I was the chief editor there for about, about a year. So I guess it was around about the same time I allowed my pre creativity to come out and I started saying, well, yes, I'm a writer. Um, I think that at the start, it was kind of like a guilty little secret. I know this isn't how you're meant to do it, Bridie. You're perfectly right about owning it and everything, but I was not comfortable with coming out there and calling myself that to other people, but I, I secretly thought of myself that way. And then I started sort of publicly talking about being a writer as my profession around the time Mind Cull was accepted for publication. But you know, when I was 13, I sent a manuscript to a publisher and then I had a long break because the next thing I sent was mine, Carl. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so it's always been the dream and I've, yeah, I've always loved writing, but I guess I didn't call myself a writer to other people until the book was accepted. Yes, self-doubt. Self-doubt is kryptonite. It saps perseverance and 
every right is nodding every writer will agree that what the, the main thing that you need is perseverance that's what you need oh isn't it funny we have got the same crib tonight um yes because i was thinking about it and that's the thing you have to really put yourself out of your comfort zone because um, like Catherine was saying, it's perfectly normal to sort of see, oh, I am a writer secretly, but does anyone else think I'm a writer? Um, you know, you've got to push past that. You've got to promote yourself because probably no, no one else will unless you're a really, really high profile author. Um, for me, it was critique groups. Now, if any of my author friends are listening in, I'm going to clarify this by saying critique groups are wonderful. And I have been a part of some really wonderful, supportive critique groups. But I'm going to be honest too and say you only have to get one or two people in that critique group who somehow for whatever reason has taken a dislike to your work and I don't think you should be writing that way because it's not the way they write yeah and gosh their feedback could be a downer yeah. and you really have to take it constructively with all of the other feedback given by all of your other peers and say right I hear you that's right I'm going to incorporate that but maybe I can't incorporate all of your feedback because I'm the one writing this and right. not you. You know what I mean? It's my story. Um, so I think it's just getting past taking. Critique is very important. So whether you have a beta reader, someone who's reading your books before you send it to a publisher or a critique group of other writers, take it on board. It's really important, but ultimately leave, leave what you're not prepared to incorporate or will detract from your confidence or your pers your authenticity as a writer. That's my kryptonite, just being sort of put off by maybe uh, the poor critiques. Yeah. Critiques saying that my writing has not what they would have written sort of thing. Well, for both of them, you tell a story that you really care about and you tell it as well as you can and you hope it impacts on your readers. Um, but with scientific writing, the story you tell is um, constrained by the data you've collected. Um, and there are also strict rules about how you're allowed to write the story. And in fiction, you have the freedom to make up the story and choose how you want to tell it. So um, it was like um, this wonderful release when it just depended on me and I, I could say what I wanted to say and I could go off in any direction I wanted to. Um, so yeah, it, it is different, but it does have some similar similarities too, yeah. like the editing and revising, you do that for both. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Junie. I mean, uh, one of the exciting things about Book Week is there's a lot of things that are going on out there online. It's like everyone's gone in lockdown. We need something exciting. Our kids are homeschooling and damn it, we are not going to forget about Book Week. So there's all this stuff going off. And one of the exciting things to me is that um, I'm a member of the Children's Book Council of Australia, uh, the New South Wales branch. So the Children's Book Council of Australia is the one that actually runs the book of the year awards you know the famous book of the year awards so it's a it's an industry body it's a not-for-profit meaning any any funds membership or any funds raised go back to promoting literacy uh, for children um, so this year the new south wales branch eastern suburbs sub branch <laughs> took the uh, book week theme which is old worlds new worlds other worlds they invited a whole lot of new uh, writers from the New South Wales membership, uh, like really established children's writers too, like uh, Jacqueline Harvey, author of Alice Miranda, uh, Belinda Morell, author of uh, Lulu Bell, uh, really great people and people like myself who were more like emerging talent. Yeah. They said, can you submit a story or a play or an illustration, a poem for this, for all ages? So it covers kids from all ages. And you know that from start to finish, the wonderful ladies from the sub-branch of this CBCA group, okay. from submission process to publishing, six months, they independently published this book and it took its six months. It's just came back about so beautifully. And now the authors are getting out there, doing our bit to promote this wonderful anthology. And I've got a story in it, yay.
Um, so I'll take the first part first, the inspiration. So this is Mind Cull. Um, it's a futuristic thriller for young adults. And um, through my research in cognitive developmental psychology, I looked at how people change and learn from different experiences. And when I thought about how technological advances like the internet and smartphones have changed our lives so much in such a short time, it made me wonder what's next. Um, so in terms of change, the teenage years are a key time for working out who you are and developing authentic relationships. And I reckon those things are even more challenging in the context of things like social media and online gaming. And I'm, I was thinking, well, with further technological advances, it's probably going to get even harder to be a teenager. And so I, I was sort of picturing this teen in the future, like what would it be like to be a teen when people, if people rely on virtual reality headsets, the way we rely on smartphones? and everyone just dives into immersive virtual worlds. Like what would it be like if you could call someone and they appear before you as a hologram? And if you go out the door and you're sick of your surroundings, you just go somewhere else in your virtual reality. And so I came up with Isla and she's a teen who's in the running to star in a global marketing campaign for a new virtual reality skin suit. And then she gets tangled up in a sinister conspiracy. Um, yeah, so that was sort of the inspiration right. and um, with the plotting, I had the main beats at the start. So mine calls pushed forward by the problems Isla faces, so um, law enforcement officers coerce her into spying for them. Underground activists reveal a murderous plot. Someone fills her head with the strangest thoughts and I knew that she was going to have these problems in advance and I also knew the big plot twists and the ending, which of course I'm not going to tell you. Yep. <laughs> um, that was it, right? So I didn't know how I was going to get to those things. Yeah. And I just sit down and write. And sometimes stuff happened that I wasn't expecting at all <laughs> on the page. Um, and, you know, gradually it formed into the story. So it was sort of some planning and some pantsing, uh, writers call it, which means going by the seat of your pants. Yeah, I did. I had to think about this question. It's a good one. You know what? I haven't written any full-length novels yet, so I'm gonna I'm gonna look at this at a, from a different perspective than can Catherine would, because I think when you're caught up for months and months or years and years even writing a novel, it can become very personal and very consuming. The things that I've written so far are short form, so picture books. You know, we're talking under for my picture book under 300 words yeah. for this for this this story 800 words so it's a relatively short time that this this book really stays emotionally with me yeah so for me personally i think it it these characters in these books are very personal to you in that you're very um protective of them and again when you let them out into the world you know, you're very worried. What are people going to think? Yeah. What a, again, it's that critical voice, isn't it? So it's more that I'm very protective of it and I want people to love my stories as much as I do or to laugh at them, think they're funny. Yeah. But I will be honest and say that nothing's really impacted me hugely emotionally yet because I haven't written that story. Yeah, right. So for me, there's three levels to how it works. There's the reader, and then there's the psychologist, <laughs> and then there's the writer. Okay. So if, if I'm reading Mind Cull and I, as I'm writing it, and it's making me feel something as I'm reading it, like so if Isla's banter with her best friend makes me giggle, or if a scary scene makes me tense up, there's this psychologist inside me that's watching the reaction, like, oh, yes. And and then the, the author in me is really pleased. Yeah. And, that, and that, that's actually how I decide if a scene works, Junie. Um, so if I read a scene I've written and I feel nothing, I will cut that scene out or I will change it to, so it has an impact. Okay. So actually the emotional impact it has on me is how I decide if it's good writing or not.
Yeah. Oh, the cover, yeah. It's a great cover, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I'll show it to you all. Um, so when um, for this is Isla. Okay. Yeah, and when Paul Collins of Ford Street offered me the book deal, he already had something like this in mind. And on our very first phone call, he talked to me about this compelling image um, that, that was shown to him by a talented Melbourne artist called Katrina Young. So if you're interested in finding out about her, she's Cat Art Illustrations with a K. Yeah. And um, I, I have to say though, these things are neurons firing in the background. Huh? And that was me. That was me. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was my <That's> idea. <laughs> oh yeah, so for Isla, I, I'm not I'm not terribly good at this, so I think that we should get a conversation going. And cool. hashtag minecart movie. And you guys can tell me a fantastic, <laughs> talented, up and coming. Aussie actress for Isla, but I did have someone in mind when I wrote Peter Hanair. Uh, um, unfortunately, he's actually too old to play the part now because Peter Hanair is meant to be a young man, but it was Jay Lagaaya. And I could pretend that I admire him for his Star Wars role, but in fact, I'm a mother and he was my favorite play school host. <laughs> and, and when I was writing Peter Hanair, I had him in mind. <laughs> well, look, look, you put me on the spot there. So this uh -huh. is the daddy, right? <laughs> is the daddy. Yeah. And that's I did actually base all of the characters in this, the illustrations, on my family. So it's fairly true to life. But that is the daddy, that is the kid. I think the daddy would have to be Shannon Tatum if he let himself go a little bit. <laughs> I will ask you one at a time, like several questions and kindly answer as many like possible within like one minute. So I want to go to you first, Bridie. So this is going to be like fun. Okay, cool. This is the only thing I've been nervous about. It's no. You ask me something I don't know the answer to. Uh, okay. Are you ready, like Bridie? So timer yes. starts now. Favorite book to read when you were a kid? Uh, Dr. Zeus, Cat in the Hat. Okay. Favorite book to read when you were an, where you were an adult? Um, Wuthering Heights, I'll say, wow. by like Emily Bronte. <laughs> Favorite book to read to your son? Oh, gosh, yes, I had a few. There was um, one called Scary Night what? <laughs> by Leslie Gibbs okay. and uh, Stephen Michael um, King. Awesome book. And also um, one called The Gruffalo, which you probably heard of okay. <laughs> by Julia <Cool>. Donaldson <laughs> and Axel Schleffler. Cool. The author you wanted to cook for? Uh, Jackal and Harvey, uh, the and Australian what, author. She's yeah. so lovely. What food would you like to cook for that author? Um, oh, I didn't think about that part. I have to cook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll right. get my husband to now. <laughs> make a lasagna. <laughs> okay, that's lovely. Like I would like want to like try like, your your lasagna like one day. Um, well, <laughs> that's so good, Ready. And for you, like Catherine, are you ready? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Timer starts now. The first book you have read. Um, Miffy Goes to the Zoo by Dick Bruner. The book you hated but grew on you. Um. On the Jellico Road by Melina Marchetta. Confusing at the start and then it all comes together and it's fantastic. Okay. Writing scholarly paper or fiction? Fiction. <laughs> Your favorite place to write? Um, in my study. Your favorite thing being a writer? Connecting with readers. Your least favorite thing being a writer? Oh, um, waiting to hear <laughs> about all you've submitted. <laughs> yeah. And the book you wish you have written? Oh, um, so many. <laughs> uh, the Lion, Witch and Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. And like fi final question, the author you wish were your mentor? Oh, um, Suzanne Collins. 
Okay, cool. And last questions for both of, for both of you: Chris Hemsworth, Chris Evans, or Chris Pines? Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> Ready? Chris Chris Hemsworth. I've met him too. He's lovely. Oh. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. I just had to put on my author hat, Junie. Can we see that author hat? Awesome. That's lovely. <laughs> it gives me special powers when I read. <laughs> so you ready for me to go? Can I kick off? Yep. Go ahead, Brandy. Awesome. So I thought because um, Catherine's book is sort of, um, I'm assuming it's young adult, is it Catherine? Yep. Yep. So that's an older age group of readers. So for those who have tuned in with their young children or are parents or grandparents of young children and want some ideas, I'm going to read you this. It's a fun book, very funny. Don't be offended. It's just meant to be, you know, one of those silly books. And it's called Daddy and the World's Longest Poo by Bridie Wright. Now let's see if I can position myself. It's probably all backwards for the people at home. I have a daddy who does the world's longest poo. Who? Wonder where daddy is, and he is nowhere. Wonder. Look in the shed, under the table, nothing makes a sound. Look where could be? I search every bedroom in the house and think. But really, the only place he could be is behind the door of the toilet. Daddy, what are you doing in there? I say. I'm hiding from mummy. Keep away. But why does he hide from mummy while sitting on his bummy? Now, where can mummy be found? Toward the kitchen, I follow the sound. Bang, crash, splash, whirr. Wonder what she could be doing in there. Maybe she's cooking lasagna. Oh, mummy, why can't daddy come and play? Secretly, I know where he is, but I don't wish to say. Well, says mummy, he's in the loo. He's doing the world's longest poo. That's disgusting. But is it real? Real? What's coming out of his mouth? This is a poo bubble. So, is it a real poo? When mummy needs a poo, I am in and out. I can think of far better places to be without a da- doubt. Well, aren't you superior, mummy? But look what you've done. Get the toilet paper. But your daddy likes it in there, you see. It gives him a chance to think and get away from mummy. Whenever there are jobs around, your daddy is nowhere to be found. But I say, we know where he is, don't we, mummy? He's in the toilet with a funny tummy. Well, I'm not sure that's right either. Yes, darling, it's something like that. One day when you're a daddy, you'll know exactly where it's at. The toilet will become your favourite place in all the world. Somewhere away from mummy. Spend hours and hours on your bummy. <laughs> okay, I hope everyone laughed and didn't get too offended because some people get very offended by that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. Like, uh, like toilet is also like my my uh, favorite like you know place. Like, in, like. Junie, <laughs> <laughs> can I? I know I maybe have two more minutes. Can I read a tiny snippet of my my story from um, the old worlds, new worlds, and other worlds anthology? Go, go ahead. Go ahead because it's different. This one is for for readers, middle grade readers, Catherine, who are like age eight to 12. So I love Egyptian history. I don't just love to laugh on the loo. I also love 
Egyptian history. So I wrote my story based on horrible histories, that show, you know, and I called it Horrible Her Stories. Hatshepsut, Haradon or Hero. I'll just read a small snippet. If you were an ancient Egyptian, one of your favourite pharaohs of all time might have been Thutmos III, who ruled three and a half thousand years ago. His battles were legendary, but the most interesting thing about him may actually have been her story. And by her, I mean Hatshepsut, the great royal wife of Thutmos II, who was Thutmos III's dad. As a modern day fan of history, have you ever heard of either of those royals? No? Well, you're in luck. It's my job as a horrible historian to fill you in. And you have to get a copy of this book <laughs> if you want to read the rest of that story and oh. many other fantastic stories. <laughs> Yeah, I remember like King Tut. Um, so yeah, and like um, his wife. I forgot like his wife's like name. It's very like hard like to pronounce. But yeah, King Tut. Yeah, very very like you know very Egyptian like history. So well done, Brady. Uh, now, Catherine, like I'm giving like the floor to you. So can you like introduce like your work? And can you tell us more about it? And then, yeah, do like, a, and can you like tell us like what, which chapter are you like reading for us today? Um, so this is Mind Cull. Um, it's a futuristic thriller for young adults published by Ford Street. And I'm just going to read to you from the start, so from the beginning. And then if you would like to continue on, you need to get hold of the book. A big silver car slows down next to me. I'm ambling gazing at a tree frog on a mossy branch. Its tiny emerald body is perfectly still, with yellow eyes unblinking. As the car slows, the frog disappears into dense, shadowy forest. I wish I could follow it. There'd be a million hiding places behind tall, wide trunks and under spreading ferns. I tap the earbud of my headset and say, exit AVEC making the lush rainforest disappear. The street is dreary without the audiovisual enhancement program. The warehouse cladding that looms up alongside me is patterned with black and white swirls to discourage graffiti. On the other side of the road, abandoned materials litter a building site behind a high chain link fence. Why is the car pulling over? No one else is here. There are no houses, shops or offices. Both the warehouse wall and the metal fence stretch on without a door or gate in sight. The window lowers. A bald, grim-faced man stares out. He orders the car to park right next to me. I'm already sprinting away by the time the wheels stop turning. The man flings open the door and comes after me. He roars something I can't hear. I glance back. He's like a footballer on an awards night twice my size with muscles bulging under a dark suit but scarier than any footballer and i put on a burst of speed and so does man mountain what does he want is this a robbery he can take my headset and wrist gem but what if it's something worse maybe he's a violent discordant and i'm a real life target for his virtual reality fantasies no that can't be right discordants don't travel in fancy cars and wear suits I pound along the street, pumping my arms up and down, willing my feet to go faster. I need to get to the end of the wall before Man Mountain catches up. Past the wall, there are homes with windows. Someone might see what's happening and help. But the ugly wall goes on and on. It's like I'm in a nightmare, running and running, but never moving forward. I try to form the words to call the police on my headset, but my strangled wheezing is incoherent. The end of the wall finally comes into view. My chest aches, my legs throb, the heavy footsteps are close. A hot, damp hand grasps my shoulder, jerking me to a halt. I scream and smash the heel of my boot backwards. Man Mountain's leg feels like iron and a sharp pain judders up my calf. 
There's not much chance of escape now, but it's a small victory when he yelps, drops his hand and takes a half step backwards. I put down my sore foot and try to run. I don't get far. He twists my arms behind me in a tight hold. Trina! Police emergency! I gasp, activating my virtual assistant. I'm having trouble hearing you. Please repeat your command, Trina says into my earbuds. I try to give the order more clearly, but she doesn't respond. Man Mountain speaks loudly, enunciating each word as if he's talking to a little kid. International law enforcement organization. There's a deafening silence. Ilio, I rasp. He opens his meaty arms to release me. I did identify myself when I got out of the car. I straighten my body and face him. I didn't hear you. Can I scan? He holds out his wrist gem. I peer down at it so the lenses of my headset get a clear reading and ask Trina to run a scan. After a few seconds, she says, this is an officer of the International Law Enforcement Organization, number 8597320. His name and rank have been withheld. You need to come with us, Man Mountain says. An attractive long-necked woman walks towards us from the direction of the silver car. She gives Man Mountain a cool, contemptuous glance and asks him if he's okay in a voice dripping with exaggerated concern. He glowers, then he grunts, turns and hobbles to the car. The woman's regal gaze sweeps over me. I'm sorry we frightened you. She doesn't look sorry. She looks like an ice queen. I shift the weight off my sore foot. We just want to talk, she says. I lift my chin. I didn't hear what he was shouting. Perfectly understandable. Ice Queen's lips form a glacial smile. Wing Bull would give anyone a shock. Man Mountain's back is to us, but she speaks loudly enough for him to hear. He hunches over and limps faster. Ice Queen grips my arm and her crisp fragrance drifts over me as we follow him back down the street. I recognise the silver car now. It's the newest urban protection vehicle. Man Mountain opens the passenger door, squeezes himself against the central joystick and stares at the car jam screen in front. The rear compartment has no windows. The back door glides open and Ice Queen motions for me to get in. I sit on one of the seats that run along each side and the door slides shut. There's a harsh artificial light and a faint chemical odour. The car starts to move. Ice Queen's voice comes over the speaker system. Isla Fulford, we have invited you to accompany us to our headquarters to be interviewed. Anxiety gnaws at my gut. She knows my name. This isn't some kind of mix-up. Elio has come looking for me. I try to mimic her impassive tone. What for? The Ilio officers don't hear my question, or they choose not to answer it. The lenses and earbuds of my headset are not functioning in the UPV, so I peel them off. The screen of my wrist gem has gone blank. Inside my pocket, I feel for the crisp folds of my very first paper letter and pull it out. It can't be a coincidence that Ilio has picked me up the day after it arrived. Congratulations, I love Fulford. Our judges have reviewed thousands of public V-clips from all over the world to arrive at a shortlist for the Face of Pearl competition. And they chose you. When I first read those words, I crouched down on the floor to stop myself from falling over. Shortlisted to be the Face of Pearl, it had to be a trick or a mistake. For a shy girl without many real life friends, my V-clips are pretty popular. But anyone with a headset and a wrist gem can make VR recordings and post them publicly to promote their music, religion, politics or business. Basically mine are technically well executed, carefully scripted jokes, spoofs of cooking shows and how-to V-clips. I never saw them as a pathway to something bigger. 
That's why the letter was such a bombshell. The face of Pearl competition is as big as it gets. I look back at the letter. It gives us great pleasure to invite you to spend three days at Hayton House, a stately English mansion where you can trial a prototype of our cutting edge virtual reality skin suit, attend a gala celebration and meet Peter Hanair, Pearl's CEO, who will announce the competition winner. The words on the page are the same as yesterday, but the big dumb grin they brought to my face is long gone. I refold the paper, put it back in my pocket and press my clammy hands down so they stick to the smooth vinyl upholstery. After about 20 minutes, the UPV glides to a stop and the back door slides open. Ice Queen waits for me to step out and motions me forward. She curves her lips upwards, but the smile doesn't reach her dark, watchful eyes. Vehicles stream past, man mountains a few metres ahead, staring up at the scanner above tinted glass doors at the base of a nondescript high-rise building. I hesitate before joining him. I can't get over how large he is. The lift has a quiet, efficient hum. Man Mountain holds out a massive hand. Give me a wrist German headset. I step back. I can't afford new ones, and I won't be able to go to school or buy anything without them. Or post V-clips and play with your friends, he sneers. Don't worry, you'll get them back. Reluctantly, I unstrap, I unstrap my wrist gem, pull my headset out of my pocket and hand them both over. On the 17th floor, we go into a grey and windowless space with access to a long corridor. Man Mountain disappears into the first room on our left. He closes the door before I can see inside. Ice Queen takes me to an interview room. In the centre, under a merciless fluorescent light, there's a small plain table surrounded by three metal chairs. The walls and ceiling are a stark, uncompromising white. Ice Queen moves to one of the chairs and gestures for me to take the seat opposite. A couple of minutes later, Man Mountain comes in and puts a plastic water cup in front of me. He picks up a chair and moves it over to one side, then sets it down facing me. His eyes avoid mine. Ayla! Ice Queen inclines her head her blue-black hair shining, the thin silver wire of her headset gleaming. This time she doesn't even offer one of her chilly smiles. We brought you here because we need your help. We know your virtual, your public virtual reality clips have been shortlisted in Pearl's competition. The smooth, symmetrical planes of her face are accentuated in the bright light, making it seem like she's wearing a sleek, pale mask. She stops talking and looks at me. But I'm not going to give myself away by crying, yelling, or asking questions. Instead, I wait, expressionless. I'm good at that. Adults have used the trick of expectant silence on me many times since my mother died. Teachers, counsellors, and social workers all assume that if they make the gap in the conversation, I'll jump in and spill my thoughts and feelings into the space. But I never do. In this all too familiar situation of being forced to sit in a room with an adult who wants me to speak, I slip into my default response of uncooperative quietness. Any feelings I have, any fear or uncertainty are locked up in the inner keep of my fortress. I'm made of granite. Has anything unusual happened to you since you received the letter from Pearl yesterday? She asks. Have you been contacted by anyone you don't know? I shake my head. Just you and him? I point to Man Mountain. Ice Queen leans forward. Are you aware that if we can demonstrate a reasonable belief that a person can assist us in an investigation, we're able to hold them for up to eight hours? I nod. She hands me an ugly navy headset that resembles a pair of thick frame spectacles with bulky earbuds dangling from the sides. I put it on and she taps her headset and gives the order for us to merge views. Together we watch a thin man in a yellow courier's uniform materialise, raising his wrist gem to a scanner. 
I look away. Somehow, Ice Queen's obtained a recording of data relayed to my headset yesterday, even though it was sent from a private residential security system. If you do not attend to each aspect of our presentation and give a clear verbal response to every question, we will charge you with failure to assist us, she says, tapping her headset to pause the VR. As I'm sure you know, failure to assist is a serious offence that carries heavy penalties, even for minors. I drag my gaze back to the frozen courier who stood at my cousin's front door a day ago holding a letter addressed to me. Was this the first time you knew you'd been shortlisted? Ice Queen asks, yeah. She skips the V clip forward to the call that I made from my headset after the courier left, causing a virtual May in yesterday's clothes to appear. Hi, Isla. It's hard not to cringe as Ice Queen replays the conversation I had with my best friend the day before. In my earbuds, my voice says, you're not gonna believe this. May's small, delicate face breaks into a smile. What? Look. She reads the words in the image I've sent her. Her jaw drops. They shortlisted you for the face of Pearl? In the replay of our vehicle, the silence that follows seems smug. But at the time, I was beaming at her like an idiot. You? She goggles at me. No way. My voice says, thanks for the vote of confidence. Sorry, May says, you know I love your public V clips. Lots of people do. But girl, this is a whole new level. You're gonna be really, really famous. She waves both hands in the air. The face of Pearl. She spins around. Amazing, woohoo. Ice Queen taps her headset and stops the VR. May Lou, your school friend, I clench my teeth and nod. Three years ago, May and I were the only two state school students to be accepted into a national skills enhancement program in computing. After that, it didn't take long for the defensive banding together of two outsiders to grow into closeness. Are you aware that May is involved with an activist group that carries out illegal activities? And if you want to find out what Isla says, <laughs> you need to get the book. <laughs> that was an intense and very like you know creative way of reading like your book. It's very very intriguing and interesting. So for those who are like you know interested to know where they can like purchase like your books, um, Bridie, like where can they where can we like get the those books? Great, thank you. So this, as I mentioned, is a not-for-profit initiative to promote Book Week. The best place to go if you want a copy of Old Worlds, New Worlds and Other Worlds is to the CBCA website. I'll give that uh, that web link. cbcansw.org.au cbcansw.org.au or email to cbcansw at bigpond.com and that's that's available right now um now daddy and the world's longest poo i published this through lulu lulu so it's lulu.com l-u-l-u.com and a shout out to radio northern beaches too thanks junie and i look forward to playing this episode on radio wow. northern beaches thank you thank you and like for those who don't know like cba like cba or like children's book uh, association is the first one who actually like you know set, um started this book week so they're very like you know good association like organization how about you katherine where can we like purchase like, isla's um story um can i share screen now sure um so um First of all, thanks a lot. It's been great talking to everyone. And thanks, Ginny and Nextdoor and Bridie and everyone who's come. If you're interested in buying a copy of Mindcull, either as a paperback or an ebook, there are links up on my website. And I really love hearing from readers. I do a lot of school and library talks. So hop on to khkenobi.com if you're interested in getting in touch with me for any reason that's k-h-c-a-n-o-b-i.com and i'll leave you with a question who can you trust when nothing is as real as virtual reality how 
very very like nice question like yeah that makes me like ponder like my <laughs> <laughs> oh but well thank you so much so thank you thank you like Catherine and like you know uh Bridey. um thank you like for giving us the, your time and like for the interview like for the questions and for the insights thank you so much and that actually concludes our event for today but if you're looking for book clubs in your like neighborhood join next door Um, as it is that platform that we can like you know not only like book clubs but other like you no know, stuff as well. So I really want to end this by saying my favorite like quote about reading, which is a book is a gift that you can open again and again. So thank you everyone. This has been your host Juni. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you Catherine. Thank you. Bye all. Right thank again. you. Bye. Thanks Juni. Thanks next door.